I just really struggle with the robustness and the generalizability of a finding where even within this cohort, you know, because the, the place that most people go with this when they see this headline is, oh, shit, I need to stop having diet soda. And I guess I'll switch to like regular sugared beverages, like maybe fruit juice or mm -hmm. maybe a full sugar soda, whatever the case may be. But even within this cohort, artificially sweet, artificial, uh, artificially sweetened beverages were not associated with cancer risk, but sugar sweetened beverages were. And even 100% fruit juice was significantly associated with cancer within this cohort. And so uh, if the utility of this is to basically find an alternative beverage for your, uh, you know, artificially sweetened beverage, uh, it doesn't leave a lot on the table, really. Because uh, if you're going for fruit juice, if you're going for a full sugar beverage based on this study, it wouldn't necessarily indicate that that's a trade-off that would be indicated. Um, and I thought one other thing that kind of uh, relates to that, I, as I was going through this, I was thinking, okay, so what exactly is the alternative here? Because uh, usually when people talk about artificial sweeteners, it's about the trade-off between having something that's artificially sweetened versus something that is sweetened with sugar or some other kind of caloric sweetener like honey or something like that. Uh, so what they did here in this study was they broke it down into like a grid with six categories. So it was like, you're either eating above the sugar recommendation or, or you're below it. So high sugar intake or low. Um, and then also you had no artificial sweeteners uh, or low artificial sweetener intake or high. So you've got for artificial sweeteners, three categories, none, low or high. And then for sugar, you're above the re recommendation or you're below. So the hierarchy that they kind of set up in one of the supplementary figures was the best case scenario for cancer risk based on the, this cohort, these findings, was low sugar intake and no artificial sweeteners. Um, fair enough, not very fun for your taste buds. Uh, then they've got this kind of next best thing, which uh, was you know slightly elevated in terms of cancer risk, again, within this cohort. And it was, you know, if you had low sugar intake and low artificial sweetener intake, if you had low sugar intake and high artificial sweetener intake, or if you had high sugar intake and no artificial sweetener intake, all three of those were pretty much equivalent in terms of the uh, cancer incidence or you know, the, the hazard ratio calculated. The worst case scenario was, was two categories or, or two kind of combinations of these categories high sugar with low artificial sweetener intake or high sugar with high artificial sweetener intake. So it would seem for some reason that the, you know, if we're assuming that there, you know, really is a deleterious impact here of artificial sweeteners, it seemed to be most pronounced in the people who had high sugar intakes. But when you look at the people who had really, or who were below the daily recommendation for sugar, it really wasn't so bad. You know, it was this kind of middle of the road kind of pack where there was all these different combinations of sugar and artificial sweeteners that weren't as good as the low sugar, no sweetener group. Uh, but still, it, it wasn't getting into those really high elevations that were observed in people who were eating a lot of sugar in combination with a lot of artificial sweeteners, um, the, the low or the high artificial sweetener group. So in a nutshell, uh, you might be looking at, at these findings and being like, man, these seem kind of contradictory, kind of counterintuitive. There doesn't seem to be that clear of a dose response relationship. Um, within the cohort, it looks like the way you define artificial sweetener intake has a huge impact. Uh, like the source of, of the artificial sweeteners has a big impact. Overall, I'm just not really convinced that these are these associations reported are truly robust and generalizable and have a huge impact on cancer risk. So I personally, I looked through this paper, I don't find it to be particularly concerning. Doesn't mean the researchers did anything wrong, but that is kind of the nature of nutritional epidemiology. If, if you put all of your food related decisions into a singular finding from nutritional epidemiology, you would have a very confusing time trying to put together a diet that had, you know, no potentially deleterious uh, uh, outcomes likely.